I want to hear about this trip, man. Yeah, fill me in. So I, I, I got a buddy that's stationed out in San Diego, and he's got, you know, like a little 26-foot Grady White. Yep. Um, and he's big into spearfishing. He's a frother. And, you know, every summer I like to try and go out there and shoot bluefin. So this past September I went. Um, and, you know, for anyone that's not familiar, uh, the West Coast of California has a big bluefin tuna run during the summer. And it's a good opportunity to shoot, you know, the fish of a lifetime. So I go out there. The first day we take his buddy's charter boat out. And we're off one of the, the islands off California. And, you know, it's like 50 nautical miles out there to where, to where the spot is. Mm. And so we're just hanging out on the boat. And it's like that typical, like, green, murky California water. And I'm just looking out. We're like, we're looking for the tuna because we heard we were there or we heard that they were there and off in the distance i see like a finlet sticking out of the water and then and then behind it like just fins and fins and fins and fins and it was it was like a 50 meter like long school of bluefin tuna just like spinning on the surface they're just swimming on the surface it's like nothing i've ever heard of or seen Right. I don't. I don't know that they do that. Um, the southern bluefin tuna down in New yeah. Zealand. No, I think they sort of do. Like my mate. Um, do they? My mate Eckhart. He's saltwater sessions on um, Instagram. He's got a video about how to find them, and it was some similar behavior to what you're saying. You can see them from the surface, but you've got to you've got to understand what you're looking for. I think. Yeah, and it's so hard. the The boat captain that we were with and my buddy, they're really good at spotting them. For me, it was hard to differentiate the difference between just like some texture on the water from the wind yeah. versus like a school of them yeah um, that's the bar this, yeah this was like a legit school like bluefin tuna sickles like sticking out of the water and and the way that these schools are shaped is they're kind of like an iceberg so if you can see them at the top like there's just a whole group of them down at the bottom wow right so we motor up to it and we shut off the boat we drift perfectly into like the uh the path of the tuna and I punch a dive and you know just huge vortex like 100 to 150 pound tuna <laughs> um, so <clears throat> the thing is they don't they don't completely give it up to you like I was down there and I was like trying to aim up on one but they're they're reacting to your actions right uh. so you kind of got to like you know feign a little bit anyways I get a shaft into one shoot him straight through the back thing takes off starts pulling the float the school takes off and the fight's on. So I'm like, I'm pulling up my bungee, pulling up my bungee. I got my fighting float, which I clip onto my bungee, something that they do in California, not so much in Hawaii. I get the I get the boof and tuna up to the shooting line, right? Yeah. And it's it's like a legit like 150 pound fish at the shooting line, got the dyneme on, and I'm I'm just fighting them. I'm trying to get them up, and the thing is just working me, bro. Yeah. Like Everyone says dog tooth tuna is the strongest fish, but like I think you know yellowfin and bluefin, they just got more endurance. They just fight longer, you yeah, know. Right. So I'm fighting this thing for no kidding. Like I got him at the shooting line for like five or six minutes. I'm like, dude, this fight's taking way too long. My buddy finally shows up with the uh, the backup gun. I load up the backup gun. He's holding the shooting line. I punch a dive to sh- uh, to put in the backup shot, and dude, like a lightning bolt out of nowhere like this eight or nine foot streak of silver just comes in, wow, wow, whacks the tail off, whacks the head. It was a giant Mako shark. <laughs> Freaking huge Mako just oh, rips up my bluefin tuna, takes all my gear down to the bottom and, you know, um, just took the whole fish literally within like, like 10 seconds. And it, like, like I've, we've got sharks here in Hawaii like, um, you know, oceanics and gray reef sharks and stuff like that. Dude, that Mako shark was like a machine. Yeah, that, yeah. Those things are no joke in the water. Yeah. And, like, I was, I was like, holy crap, man. I pulled my shooting line up. I got my shaft back. I've got, like, some 1,100-pound uh, Spectra rigged on my slip tip. Thing was, like, sheared clean off, like, with a pair of scissors. Thing was just gone. Um, so, yeah. Have you seen that HD footage out the back of a trawling boat before of a Mako? No, I haven't. I've seen this footage, and it's this wide-angle camera, so, like, you can kind of see, like, maybe 80 meters side-to-side vision out the back of this 
trolling game boat. And the game boat's doing like, you know, probably like 15, 20 knots. And they've got these teasers out in a pattern and lures out the back. And this Mako comes in and it's moving from one side of the screen to the other, which is covering 80 meters. And it's coming forward at this boat. And the acceleration curve on this animal is like nothing you've ever seen before. It's like, they're like the Usain Bolt of sharks. This thing, I think, I think they clocked it at 72 kilometers an hour. And I, think, I don't know how they come up with the figure. But just watching this animal in its element, full hunting, it's that, 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 they're a scary shark. And um, Dude. that's so fast. Yeah, unreal, unreal. Um, yeah, man, I, I got out of the water after that. I was like, I'm, <laughs> I'm hanging it up, bro. I'm not shooting up <laughs> tuna because it's, it's that murky green California water, man. And it's like yeah, yeah. a big, big animal. I've uh, seen a few guys come unstuck in like the green current, dirty water that's dark. Like I was out with this one dude. He's like, you know, 140 foot diver or something. And here's a little old me like flat out diving 60 feet. We're diving together on this channel market. It must have been. Would have been 80 feet or something, but it was dark and current, five meters viz, that nasty green shit where you're thinking like, okay, there's a great white here somewhere. And um, we were having turns at dropping it because with a channel marker, you pretty much like, you you know, you do a drop each, you can tell what's around. Anyway, he, he did a drop and he just bailed halfway and he was like, I'm going back to the boat, bro. I don't like it. <laughs> and I felt so much better about myself. Like just, it's good to sometimes see really competent people be just as like you know weary and kind of nervous as you are it's kind oh of- yeah 100 percent. yeah i'm like am i am i the only one that's tripping out on this <laughs> dude chris coates recently posted a video of him shooting like a uh, spanish mackerel on a shore dive off the coast of wherever he's at in africa yeah, yeah. this dude is diving like um like before first light in the morning he's making like solid deep drops to like i don't i don't know how deep he was diving but it wasn't shallow in like pitch black water i was like yo this guy is out of his mind like that's some insane diving right there i would not be doing that yeah, those south african <laughs> guys man like he's in uh he's off durban Hardcore. he's off durban but all of those guys the western cape eastern cape divers they are all crazy so that that's why they're some of the best divers in the world that they are 100%. used to just diving slop and diving hard yeah. and just punching dives in miserable conditions and like, you know, they might be in 60 feet, but like, you know, it's different than being in crystal clear hundred foot with no, no, no current and no great whites, you know, like, yeah, you, you got to respect and them. They, eh? Dude, they've got the bull sharks out there too. Dude, yeah. all the Rob Allen, Chris Coates, those guys are my heroes, man. <laughs> they're freaking, they're next level. Yeah. Um, have you seen that yeah, big Mako shark? Have you seen yeah. that um, Yako Blignort? Yako. I have not. I have to check him out. He's a comp diver, but he's just like, yeah, he's just like one of those dudes where you're like, you know, you'd put him up there against the best in the world, you know, maybe not in, yeah. maybe not in the mid. I don't know. I think he has done even well over there, but like you put him in their conditions and like, I think that may be unbeatable. If, if they had a world oh, yeah. in South Africa, no one's winning it except a South African. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. That crazy. Um, Have you got any sponsors, man? Uh, no sponsors, no sponsors, sponsor myself, sponsored by Hawaiian airlines. That's who I work for. So I get, I get some free flights out of that. What do you do? Um, Shout out to them. Um, I support their maintenance operation over in Honolulu. Okay. So, yeah. And then part-time work for the, I'm a bosun's mate in the United States Coast Guard. Ah, I wonder what you can Out on the small boats a little bit. Cool, man. Hey, let me let me finish my bluefin tuna story. Though. Yeah, sorry, so, bro. Sorry. <laughs> I, no, no, we're good. We're good. So uh, I get that big tuna tax. We go back to mainland California. The plan the next day was to take out my buddy's small boat, the, the 24-foot Grady White, and go back to the same spot. So we punch it out the next day. Mind you, we're like, it was like 50 or 60 nautical miles to where we were at. Um, but the thing is about tuna is that they move around. So they, they might be one place one day and then the next day they're off in a different area. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we're, we're off kind of looking for like the, the commercial fleet, which is like the big boats that, you know, they, they'll find the tuna. So we're, we're looking for the commercial fleet. And it turns out that the tuna were north of the island. So that was like another like 30 or 40 nautical miles from where we were at. 
So we punch it out there, long ride, and we get out there, man, and it's it's north of the island. We're in straight up open ocean and we're on like a 24 foot grady white. I'm looking around me. There is not one commercial boat that's less than 40 feet out there. And it's like, we're in like straight up open ocean, man. So I was like, holy crap. Um, but we start marking tuna. So my buddy, he's at the helm and then I'm with his friends and we're both hanging off the back and uh, we're like sounding for the tuna. And I, I look down in the water, man. And it's, it's not green anymore. It's like crystal clear blue water, like yeah. offshore open ocean. Like, I don't know how deep it was there, but it must have been in the thousands of feet. Right. Um, so he marks them. We find them. I, I drop down on the breezer. Again, just school vortex by them. Plug one, big one. Boom, boom, boom. Get them up. Backup shot on the boat. We, uh, we look for the next, we, ne- we find the next school. Um, his buddy gets on one, boom, his first boost in tuna was like 150 pounds. Then I take the helm. I get my buddy on a breezer. He shoots one, boom, like another 160 pounder. We had like three, like over 150 plus pound tuna on the, on the boat. Right. <laughs> and like, it was all in the span of maybe like two hours. And like, we're all absolutely like losing our minds, like on adrenaline in that moment, you know, we're all yeah. freaking out and I wanted to stay out and keep shooting more. And by this <laughs> point, it's, it was like two or three in the afternoon. Yeah. And, um, like we're a hundred nautical miles offshore. So my buddy's like, Hey, we got to get out of here. So I was like, okay, let's start heading back to land. So he, we, we got all the tunas on the deck, everything squared away. We go to kick the engine on, boom, we're moving. And we can't get the boat above like a thousand RPM. <laughs> so we're like, huh, that's weird. So we, you know, we check the outboard, everything's clear. And we're just, we can't move. We're moving slow. And I'm like, oh, maybe it's the way to the tuna or something. My buddy, the captain, goes to the, goes to the aft deck. And he lifts up one of the compartments and it's completely flooded with water. We're a hundred nautical miles offshore. We're in a wooden Grady White. And our boat's flooding. So I was like, bro, get the boat in gear. Me and the other dude, we start bailing water out. Yeah. We get all the water out. We get on plane. Yeah. We find out that the, the bilge had stopped working. Uh, and I guess there was like a leak on one of the ports on the starboard side. Yeah. So we're taking on water. And I'm like, dude, holy crap, man. Like, like I'm in a Coast Guard. Like, uh, like I know when like you're in a hairy situation, right? Yeah, yeah. So we got the boat up on plane though. And, you know, we we're, we we're doing like checks every five minutes to see if we were taking on water and it was pretty good. Um, and we had the decision of whether or not we wanted to stop at the island and try and resolve it or just keep going to mainland Cali. And we decided to just keep pushing towards Cali. Yeah. So of course, once we get out of the lee of the island, we still got another 50 nautical miles or so. Mm. And the conditions just got nuts. Like, big, huge brown swell, and then like short interval wind swell way offshore. And like I said, it's a wooden boat. I don't know if you've ever been on a Grady White, but they've got like these cabinets for the forward compartment. Every time we slammed on a wave, it sounded like the boat was going to crack in half. Yeah, dude. Yeah, yeah. So anyways, we're all like white knuckling, you know, the freaking dashboard and it's a real quiet ride. And we're just like, you know, Nobody wants to say anything to like make the situation worse, right? In, yeah. in, in a tight in a tight spot like that. So we're hanging on, and um, you know it's just gnarly ocean conditions. And I remember the night before. I don't know if you're like a spiritual man, but I was I was praying to God for oh. for tuna, right? <laughs> I was like, God, you know, I'm only here for a weekend. If you could please just get me a tuna, I would I would then I would be happy, you know, selfishly. And I remember that prayer. And then in that moment, like, I don't know if it was God or what, but I I felt, I felt him say like, you know, I provide you with what you, with what you want, but you still don't believe that I can provide you with what you need, which in that moment was my life, you know? And I was, I was still, you know, scared, but in that moment I knew that we were going to get home. Okay. Um, And, you know, eventually we made it back safe to the Harbor and I'm sure all the Cali guys listening are like, man, what a bunch of kooks. But <laughs> <laughs> we made it back and uh, everything was good. But it was it was definitely one for the both. Sort of